Phil Levine here yet? Hell, he'll be here. I hope he better be here. Uh, not a, quite a while, I guess about eight, nine months ago, for, for those of you that don't know, uh, Tuesday nights, the folk people have come here and, uh, and had folk music. And about 10 months ago, they invited me to come and read poetry, and I did, and everybody seemed to like it. So we've been making it a habit of doing poetry and folk music. And uh, it's kind of, it's come quite a ways, and there's been some real energy-filled nights with folk music and poetry. And uh, it's, uh, it's nice for me to come to a, a place where people can sit and drink, and then, and then when the poets read, everybody shuts up and listens to poetry. And that's nice. I really, uh, it's kind of unusual, too. Uh, and then the other day, I ran into Larry Levis at the uh, Crow. And uh, I said, hey, Larry, uh, would you mind reading? And he said, sure, I'll read. So, and I was uh, real lucky to get Larry to read. He's, uh, I don't know, I've got a crazy list here of stuff to say about him, and I'm not going to say it all, I'll tell you that. It probably sounds ridiculous, but I'm so in love with this guy's poetry, and, and he's developed and developed and developed, and... Uh, Really, uh, he went to school here like a lot of us, and there's a number of poets out here. Studied under Philip Levine, and went on to uh, Iowa and then Missouri, I think. And uh, I hear rumors about him. I hardly ever see him. I see hear these rumors about him. The best young poet in America. And uh, anyway, you better be getting ready to read because I'm almost run out of words here, Barry. Uh, he has a way of moving through affinities and familiarities into uh, personas. And uh, these personas are deep and well conceived and he has the ability to, to go deep within himself and carry on processes of visualization, and formulate some really, really beautifully crafted poems. And he could just, I've read some of them, I've read over and over, and I never get tired. Are you stealing my microphone? And he seems to have, he doesn't, you're not cheated. There's so much going on there that, that a lot of other poets might leave out or not be able to deal with. There's anger, there's every kind of human emotion. There's a sense of, of, of uh, well, I'm not going to go on talking anymore. Larry, you better get out here better to read. I'm running out of words. This is a really fine book. Wonderful introduction. Uh, it, it, was, it took me about ten minutes to realize. I'm wondering who he was talking about. Here. Well, let's see. Let me just begin with a poem uh, that I wrote here in California. I actually wrote it uh, in Los Angeles, where I lived for a while. Uh, I, I used to teach there. California State University, Los Angeles. I talked with a great Polish poet named Zbigniew Herbert, and um, he uh, wanted to stay on there 
and not go back to Poland, but they wanted him to teach composition. And he, since he didn't speak English very well, it was difficult. Uh, and th they thought that he couldn't really teach composition because his English was so bad. But I thought most of, most of us who were on the faculty had, I mean, our English was not good enough to teach composition. But <laughs> anyway, he, uh, he had refused to join the Communist Party and he fought as a teenager in, in the underground against the Nazis in Poland. And uh, I guess he simply wasn't frightened by an English department and left. This is a poem called for Zbigniew Herbert, Summer 1971, Los Angeles. No matter how hard I listen, the wind speaks one syllable, which has no comfort in it, only a rasping of air through the dead elm. Once a poet told me of his friend who was torn apart by two pigs in a field in Poland. The man was a prisoner of the Nazis, and they watched, he said, with interest and a drunken approval. If terror is a state of complete understanding, then there was probably a point at which the man went mad and felt nothing. Although certainly he understood everything that was there. After all, he could see his blood splash beneath him on the stubble. He could hear singing float toward him from the barracks. And though I don't know much about madness, I know it lives in the thin body like a harp behind the rib cage. It makes it painful to move. And when you kneel in madness, your knees are glass. And so you must stand up again with great care. Perhaps this wind was all he heard in 1941. Perhaps I have raised a dead man into this air. And now I must bury him inside my body and breathe him in and do nothing but listen until I hear the black blood rushing over the stone of my skull and believe it is music. But some things are not possible on the earth. And that is why people make poems about the dead. And the dead watch over them until they are finished, until their hands feel like glass on the page, until snow collects in the blind eyes of statues, I have a lot of poems about Selma, where I grew up. Um, I heard recently that Fresno is ranked the last city in the United States that you'd want to live in. But obviously, they're wrong. It's Selma. <laughs> but of course, I don't think the, the researchers got down to Selma. Anyway, this, this is a poem called Adolescence, and it's for two people I know who are now dead. Um, Sharon and Earl uh, Densford, who were my friends, and uh, a daughter and her father. He, was, he trained horses. Uh, and I would occasionally help him, although he would never give me anything very responsible to do, especially with race horses. Um, he wasn't, I mean, it, it sounds like it, it's a wealthy setup, but it wasn't. Uh, um, I mean, I could have set back racehorses 20 years had I been allowed to touch them or come near them. But, but so he was very wise in you know, keeping me away from it. A poem called Adolescence. It begins in Iowa City, Iowa, and goes back to Selma and winds up somewhere in the Sierras. And because he used to work up there in construction, um, you know, in the winter, and well, in the autumn, summer, so forth, not in the winter. Adolescents. Our babysitter lives across from the Dodge Street Cemetery and behind her broad, untroubled face. Her sons play touch football all afternoon among the graves of clerks and Norwegian settlers. At night, these huge trees rooted in such quiet arch over the tombstones as if in exultation, as if they inhaled starlight. Their limbs reach toward each other and their roots must touch the dead. When I was 15, there was a girl who loved me, who I did not love, and she died that year of spinal meningitis. 
By then she had already left home and was working in a carnival, one of those booths where you're supposed to toss a dime into a small dish. Finally, in Laredo, Texas, someone anonymous and too late bought her a bus ticket back. Her father, a gambler and horse dealer, wept openly the day she was buried. I remember looking off in embarrassment at the woods behind his house. The woods were gray, vagrant, the color of smoke or sky. I remember thinking then that if I had loved her, or even slept with her once, she might still be alive. And if instead we had gone away together on two bay horses that farted when they began to gallop, and if later we had let them graze at their leisure on the small tufts of spring grass in those woods, and if the disintegrating print of the ferns was a lullaby there against the dry stones and the trunks of fallen trees, then maybe nothing would have happened. There are times hiking with my wife past abandoned orchards of freckled apples and patches of sunlight in New Hampshire, or holding her closely against me at night until she sleeps when nothing else matters, when the trees shine without meaning more than they are in moonlight, and when it seems possible to disappear wholly into someone else as if into a wish on a birthday, the candles trembling. Maybe nothing would have happened. But I heard that her father died a year later in a Sierra lumber camp. He had been drinking steadily all week and was, and was dealing cards when the muscle of his own heart kicked him back into his chair so hard its wood snapped. He must have thought there was something suddenly very young inside his body if he had time to think. And of death as an adolescent, closing his eyes to the music on the radio of that passing car, I think he does not know his own strength. If I stand here long enough in this stillness, I can feel his silence involved somehow, the silence of these trees, the sky, the little squawking toy my son lost when it slipped into the river today. Today I'm 34 years old. I know that horse dealer with a limp loved his plain and crazy daughter. I know also that it did no good. Soon the snows will come again and cover that place where he sat at a wobbling card table underneath a ponderosa pine and cover even the three cards he dropped there, three silent diamonds, and cover everything in the Sierras and make my meaning plain. There was a way in which uh, being on a farm was strange. And, I mean, farms in their growing up on them. Childhood is strange, probably. And um, and uh, little places outside Selma and Parley are make it even weirder. Uh, this is a poem called Family Romance. Uh, family Romance, you know, referring to that Freudian business, but the poem misunderstands it because you say I'm not very smart. So beautifully <laughs> that you don't need even to know about Freud. Family Romance. It begins with a little address. Sister once of weeds in a dark water that held still in ditches reflecting the odd abstaining clouds that passed and kept their own counsel. We were different. We kept our own counsel. Outside the tool shed in the noon heat while our father ground some piece of metal that would finally fit with grease and an hour of pushing the needs of the mysterious Ford tractor. We argued out in adolescence whole systems of mathematics, ethics, and finally agreed that altruism, whose long vowel sounded the Japanese on neighboring farms were, we guessed, a little better off. When I was 12, I used to stare at weeds along the road at the way they kept trembling long after a car had passed, or at gnats and families hovering over some rotting peaches and wonder why it was I had been born a human. Why not a weed or a gnat? Why not a horse or a spider? And why an American? 
I did not think that anything could choose me to be a Larry Levis before there even was a Larry Levis. It was strange, but not strange enough to warrant some design. On the outside, the barn with flaking paint was still off-white. Inside, it was always dark, all the way up to the rafters where the pigeons moaned, I later thought, as if in sexual complaint or sexual fulfillment. I never found out which. When I walked in with a 12 gauge and started shooting, they fell like grapefruit at my feet, fat thumping things that grew quieter when their eyelids a softer gray closed part of the way. They fell like grapefruit at my feet, fat thumping things that grew quieter when their eyelids a softer gray closed part of the way at least. And their friends or lovers flew out a kind of skylight cut for loading hay. I don't know exactly what happened then, except my sister moved to Switzerland. My brother got a job with Colgate Palm Island. He was selling soap in Lodi, California. Later in his car and dressed to die or live again forever, I drove to my own first wedding. I smelled the stale boutonniere in my lapel, a deceased young flower. I wondered how my brother's Buick could go so fast and still questioning or catching. A last time, an old chill from childhood, I thought, why me? Why her? I knew it wouldn't last. I, I did have that distinct impression driving to my first wedding that there was this little adolescent voice, about a 12 year old voice, who seemed to have a supremely, um, seemed to somehow to have this supreme French classical rationality. It was interrogating me, saying, you know, of course, this won't last. I mean, you're temperamentally unsuited for each other. It's great sex, but you know, it's, it's simply, that's, that's a frill. <laughs> um, you know, the way in which, you know, when you're 12, you have this absolute clarity about things. And after that, it just gets murkier and murkier as, as the years go by. So that you have absolutely no clarity left. This too is a little poem about farming. It's called Some Grass Along a Ditch Bank. I don't know what happens to grass, but it doesn't die exactly. It turns white in winter, but stays there a few yards from the ditch, then comes back in March, turning a green that has nothing to do with us. Mostly it's just yellow or tan. It blends in. Swayed by the wind, maybe, but not by any emotion or partisan stripe. You can misread it at times. I've seen it almost appear to fight long and well for its right to be and be grass when I tried pulling it out. I thought I could almost sense it digging in, not with reproach exactly, but with a kind of rare tact that I miss sometimes in others. And besides, if you really wanted it out, you'd have to disc it under, standing on a shuddering case tractor and staring into the distance like someone with a vision in the wrong place for visions. With time you'd feel silly, and always it comes back at the end of some winter when the sky has neither sun nor snow, nor anything personal. You'd be wary of any impulse that seemed mostly cosmetic. It's all a matter of taste and how taste changes. Besides, in March, the fields are wet, the trucks and machinery won't start, and the blades of a disc won't turn, usually, because of the rust. It's when you notice the grass coming back in some other spot, and with a different shape this time, as if it had an idea of a peninsula, maybe, or its form, reclining on some map you almost begin to remember. In March, my father spent hours just piecing together some puzzle that might start up a tractor or set the tines of a cultivator or spring tooth right and do it without spending money. Those rows of gray earth that look cold between each row of vines and run off to the horizon as you drive past, you could almost say it was almost pretty. But this place isn't France. For years, they've made only raisins and a cheap sweet wine. And someone had to work late, as bored as you are probably, but with the added headache of owning some piece of land that never gave up much without a mute argument. 
The lucky sold out to developers, and this is for one who stayed, and how after a few years, he even felt sympathy for grass, then felt that turn into a resentment, which grew finally into a variety of puzzled envy, turning a little grass under with each acre, and turning it under for miles, while his whole life spent on top of a tractor went by unnoticed, without feast days or celebrations, opening his mailbox at the roadside, which was incapable of looking any different, more picturesque or less common, the rank but still blossoming weeds, stirring a little maybe as you drove past, but then growing still again. My father was always a, a kind of difficult, I mean, there's a poem here called Winter Stars. Well, he wasn't a difficult man. He, was, he just was uh, remote in many ways, and there was a certain coldness about him. I don't know why. Uh, uh, I, it, I, I don't think he could do anything about it. He, he didn't intentionally seem, he wasn't intentionally that way. Um, but one thing that he liked to do, he'd be out bossing a large crew of men, and he'd come in, um, for lunch, and then he'd, he'd close off the living room, the curtains, and, and close out all light, and just lay there in the darkness listening to music, classical music usually, or opera, and when I would come in, he'd tell me, you know, to leave. It was my time to be alone, kid, get out of here. You know. and I'd say, what's that weird stuff you're listening to? You, know, you can't even understand the language. He'd say, go, go. Then he'd go back out, you know, work on the farm. My father once broke a man's hand over the exhaust pipe of a John Deere tractor. The man, Ruben Vasquez, wanted to kill his own father with a sharpened fruit knife, and he held the curved tip of it lightly between his first two fingers so it could slash horizontally and with surprising grace across the throat. It was like a glinting beak in a hand. And for a moment, the light held still on those vines. When it was over, my father simply went in and ate lunch, and then, as always, lay alone in the dark, listening to music. He never mentioned it. I never understood how anyone could risk his life and then listen to Vivaldi. Sometimes I go out into this yard at night and stare through the wet branches of an oak in winter and realize I am looking at the stars again a thin haze of them, shining and persisting. It used to make me feel lighter looking up at them. In California, that light was closer. In a California no one will ever see again, my father is beginning to die. Something inside him is slowly taking back every word it ever gave him. Now if we try to talk, I watch my father search for a lost syllable as if it might solve everything. And though he can't remember now the word for it, he is ashamed. If you can think of the mind as a place continually visited, a whole city placed behind the eyes and shining, I can imagine now its end, as when the lights go off one by one in a hotel at night, until at last all of the travelers will be asleep, or until even the thin glow from the lobby is a kind of sleep. And while the woman behind the desk is applying more lacquer to her nails, you can almost believe that the elevator, as it ascends, must open upon starlight. I stand out on the street and do not go in. That was our agreement at my birth. And for years I believed that what one end said between us became empty and pure like starlight, and it persisted. I got it all wrong. I wound up believing in words the way a scientist believes in carbon after death. Tonight I'm talking to you, Father, although it is quiet here in the Midwest where a small wind the size of a wrist wakes the cold again, which may be all that's left of you and me. When I left home at 17, I left for good. That pale haze of stars goes on and on, like laughter that has found a final silent shape on a black sky, 
It means everything it cannot say. Look, it's empty out there and cold, cold enough to reconcile even a father, even a son. Yeah. I'm going to read a couple of love poems and uh, Philip Levine should be here to read it. This is a poem called There Are Two Worlds. I don't know if it has a any real relevance to Fresno, maybe I should take a little survey. How many of you have had or are now having secret, discreet, extramarital affairs? Just a little sh brief show of hands will be sufficient. You know, no, there's one, you know. I suppose that's enough, since these statistics lie. Uh, all right. This poem called There Are Two Worlds. There's a little reference to Mark Twain, to uh, Huck Finn. But it's so, I explain it so totally that he'll probably be yawning by the time I'm finished with it. It's also, it has some racehorses in it too, at the end. Perhaps the ankle of a horse is holy. Crossing the Mississippi at dusk, Clemens, that's Mark Twain, Samuel Bell. I didn't know that. You obviously are much better educated than I am. <laughs> Oh, start again. Perhaps the poor poem, I'm sorry. Okay, you'll forgive me. Perhaps the ankle of a horse is holy. Crossing the Mississippi at dusk, Clemens thought of a sequel in which Huck Finn in old age became a hermit and insane and never wrote it. And perhaps all that he left out is holy. The river anyway became a sacrament when he spoke of it. Even though the last 10 chapters were a failure he devised to please America, and make his lady happy to buy her silk, furs, and jewels with hues no one in Hannibal had ever seen. There above the river, if the pattern of the stars is a blueprint for a heaven left unfinished. I also believe the ankle of a horse in the seventh furlong is as delicate as the fine lace of faith and therefore holy. I think it was only Twain's cynicism, the smell of a river lingering in his nostrils forever that kept his humor alive to the end. I don't know how he managed it. I used to make love to a woman who, when I left, would kiss the door she held open for me as if instead of me, as if she already missed me. I would stand there in the cold air, breathing it, amused by her charm, which was like the scent of a river provocative the dusk and first lights along the shore. Should I say my soul went mad for a year and could not sleep? To whom should I say so? She was gentle and intended no harm. If the ankle of a horse is holy and if it fails in the stretch and the horse goes down and the jockey in the bright shout of his silks is pitched headlong onto the track and maimed and if later the horse is destroyed, and all that is holy is also destroyed. Hundreds of bones and muscles that try their best to be pure flight of lyric made flesh. Then I would like to go home, please. Even though I betrayed it and left. Even though I might be at such a time as I am permitted to go back to my wife, my son, no one, or no more than a stone in a pasture full of stones, full of the indifferent grasses. And Huck Finn insane by then and living alone. It will be, it might be still, a place where what can only remain holy grazes and where men might also approach with soft halters and having no alternative, lead that fast world home, though it is only to the closed dark of stalls. And though the men walk ahead of the horses slightly afraid. And at all times, in awe of their quickness and how they have nothing to lose, especially now, when the first stars appear slowly enough to be counted and the breath of horses makes white signatures on the air, last button, no kidding, brief, brief affair, and the air is colder. That's a little poem I wrote about a photograph called Sensationalism. So I'd like to read that and, and one more and then we can have music. Or 
Bill can leave. Is Bill here yet? Yeah? Yeah. Good. I'm getting tired, Bill. <laughs> I need some help. And uh, if, you, if something doesn't happen soon, I'll have to read my bad poems. We <laughs> wouldn't like that. Yeah. Okay. Sensationalism. It's about a photograph by Joseph Kodelka, a brilliant young Czech photographer. Who uh, there's nothing much going on in the photograph except a man is in an alley talking to a horse. Sensationalism. In Joseph Kodelka's photograph. Untitled and with no date given to help us with history, a man wearing dark clothes is squatting, his right hand raised slightly as if in explanation. And because he is talking seriously now to a horse that would be white except for its markings, the darkness around its eyes, muzzle, legs, and tail, by which it is technically a gray or a dapple gray, with a streak of pure white like heavy cream on its rump. There is a wall behind them both, which, like most walls, has no ideas and nothing to make us feel comfortable. After a while, because I know so little, and because the muted sunlight on that wall will not change, I begin to believe that the man's wife and children were shot and thrown into a ditch a week before this picture was taken, that this is still Czechoslovakia, and that there is the beginning of spring in the air. That is why the man is talking, and as clearly as he can to a horse. He is trying to explain these things, while the horse grays those days at the end of winter when days seem lost in thought. He is, after all, only a horse. No doubt the man knows people he could talk to. The bars are open by now. But he has chosen to confide in this gelding, as he once did to his own small children, who could not understand him any better. This afternoon, in the middle of his life and in the middle of this war, a man is trying to stay sane. To stay sane, he must keep talking to a horse, its blinders on and a rough snaffle bit still in its mouth, wearing away the corners of its mouth, with one ear cocked forward to listen, while the other tilts backward slightly, inattentive, as if suddenly catching a music behind it. Of course, I have to admit I've made all of this up and that it could be wrong to make up anything. Perhaps a man is perfectly happy. Perhaps Kudelka arranged all of this and then took the picture as a way of saying goodbye to everyone who saw it. And perhaps Joseph Kudelka was only three years old when the Nazis invaded Prague. I do not wish to interfere, reader, with your solitude, so different from my own. In fact, I would take back everything I've said here if it would make you feel any better, unless even that retraction would amount to a milder way of interfering, and a way by which you might suspect me of some subtlety, or mistake me for someone else, someone not disinterested enough in what you might think of this, of the photograph, of me. Once I was in love with a woman, and when I looked at her, my face altered and took on the shape of her face, made thin by alcohol, sorrowing, grave, and though there was a kind of pain in her face, I felt no pain when this happened to mine, when the bones of my own face seemed to change. But even this did not do us any good, and one day she went mad, waking in tears she mistook for blood, and feeling little else except for this concern about bleeding without pain. I drove her to the hospital, and then after a few days, she told me she had another lover. So, Walking up the street where it had been raining earlier, past the darkening glass of each shop window to the hotel, I felt a sensation of peace flood my body as if to cleanse it, and thought it was because I had been told the truth. But you see, even that happiness became a lie, and even that was taken from me finally, as all lies are. Later, I realized that maybe I felt strong that night only because she was sick, for other reasons and in that place. And so began my long convalescence and simple adulthood. I never felt that way again when I looked at anyone else. I never felt my face change into any other face. It is a difficult thing to do, and so maybe it is just as well. That man, for instance, 
He was a saboteur. He ended up talking to a horse and hearing on the street outside that alley the Nazis celebrating, singing even. If he went mad beside that wall, I think his last question was whether they shot his wife and children before they threw them into the ditch or after. For some reason, it mattered once, if only to him, and before he turned into paper. I'll just finish with that. I'll just finish with one sort of comic, silly poem called The Poem You Asked For, which I wrote on a bus in Fresno once when we were trying to save the world and we were blocking off streets. The poem you asked for. My poem would eat nothing. I tried giving it water, but it said no, worrying me. Day after day, I held it up to the light, turning it over, but it only pressed its lips more tightly together. It grew sullen like a toad through with being teased. I offered it all my money, my clothes, my car with a full tank, but the poem stared at the floor. Finally, I cupped it in my hands and carried it gently out into the soft air, into the evening traffic, wondering how to end things between us. For now, it had begun breathing, putting on more and more hard rings of flesh. And the poem demanded the food. It drank up all the water, beat me, and took my money, <laughs> tore the faded clothes off my back, said shit, and walked slowly away, slicking its hair down, said it was going over to your place. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Good night. He's like the, the mother hen of a lot of chickens that tend to write poetry. <laughs> That's a cruel metaphor, I guess. Uh, but uh, he's hatched a lot of us uh, and got us going. And uh, I know I have a vision in my mind that I don't ever want to perish in the dungeon of society's idealized fantasies and organized wrongdoing. I wonder where I got that vision at. Anyway, I think most of you know me, and you don't need an introduction, but he's a great guy, a great poet, and a great teacher. And, uh, and he's been able to impart to a lot of us a keen appreciation for poetry and uh, foresight. And without further ado, and getting on and, and on and all these things I have to say about this guy, I'm going to just come on up here, Phil, start reading. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take uh, Larry's survey. How many of you wear reading glasses? Uh, <laughs> uh, how many of you have uh, hemorrhoid? Uh, I don't know, Larry, Larry, I think Larry has led a more interesting life than I, and, and it will be re certainly reflected in his early death. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he won't care. We'll care. We'll say, geez, if only he'd taken care of himself the way Moulton did. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic poems we would have had. That's one thing none of my students ever learned from me. They, none of them take care of themselves. You know, they, they, they read that romantic poetry and they really believe it. For all I know, it's true, you know? That's how you, f you really find your poems, in, in cafes, and sinking ships. <laughs> cemeteries. Oh, uh, 
Someone asked me to read this poem. My son, he asked me to read this poem. It's about his uncle and me, uh, my brother and I. I guess it's a bit, uh, my brother and me. I'm going to be grammatical. <laughs> uh, it's called You Can Have It. Oh, by the way, this is my new, my selected poems. It's an incredibly handsome poem. Yeah. If you're ever in New York, uh, you might find it in a store. Uh, or I, I, uh, there's a rumor that it's in Oakland, uh, in a little uh, place where they sell magazines. At any rate, it, it came out this spring, and I was very heartened by it. It's kind of thick. Uh, my poems are taking my shape uh, <laughs> uh, as time passes. This sort of thickening. Anyway, in this poem, uh, my brother and I are the same age. And uh, that's because uh, we're always the same age. We're twins. I'm an identical twin. But my brother is nothing like me. And he doesn't even look like me. He's really not very good looking at all. Uh, he's also lardy. <laughs> he loves pork chops. City chicken. He loves city chicken. Have you ever eaten city chicken? It's um, veal or pork that comes on a stick. You know, it resembles a drumstick, but it's not chicken. We used to eat it in Detroit. At any rate, the poem is really not about being a twin. It's about brotherhood, which I think doesn't, de or sisterhood, doesn't really depend on having brothers or sisters. Depends on being human. Well, even dogs have brothers. Well, if dogs can have brothers, then cats can have brothers. Why can't Republicans have brothers? <laughs> If I'd ever taken a course of logic, I could answer that. <laughs> but they, can't, they don't have brothers. They don't have sisters. They have killed that sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. And they will win the election. That's their reward, you see, for being shits. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and our, our reward is, is to watch it. <laughs> That's uh, some reward. Okay. Remember, it will happen in November. You first heard it here. <laughs> you can have it. My brother comes home from work and climbs the stairs to our room. I can hear the bed groan and his shoes drop one by one. You can have it, he says. The moonlight streams in the window, and his unshaven face is whitened like the face of the moon. He will sleep long afternoon and waken to find me gone. Thirty years will pass before I remember that moment when suddenly I knew each man has one brother who dies when he sleeps and sleeps when he rises to face this life, and that together they are only one man sharing a heart that always labors, hands yellowed and cracked, a mouth that gasps for breath and asks, am I going to make it? All night at the ice plant, he had fed the chute its silvery blocks, and then I stacked cases of orange soda for the children of Kentucky. One gray box car at a time, with always two more waiting. We were 20 for such a short time, and always in the wrong clothes, crusted with dirt and sweat. I think now we were never 20. In 1948, in the city of Detroit, founded by De La Moth Cadillac, for the distant purposes of Henry Ford, no one wakened or died. No one walked the streets or stoked a furnace, for there was no such year. And now that year has fallen off all the old newspapers, calendars, doctor's appointments, bonds, wedding certificates, driver's licenses. 
The city slept. The snow turned to ice. The ice to standing pools or rivers racing in the gutters. Then bright grass rose between the thousands of cracked squares, and that grass died. I give you back 1948. I give you all the years from then to the coming one. Give me back the moon with its frail light falling across a face. Give me back my young brother, hard and furious, with wide shoulders and a curse for God, and burning eyes that look upon all creation and say, you can have it. You know, you ever hear William Stafford read? William Stafford has an uncanny ability. He, in his poems, at the end of his poems, he builds into the end of his poem your applause. I mean, it's stunning. He kind of, as he gets those last lines, he kind of falls back, you know, <laughs> with the beauty and the, and the tragedy of it all. Then he looks at you with this, and you, you feel, I have to revive this man. And so you applaud. And then he gets very arrogant. Immediately, it all, he's superior to you. You know, he says, please don't. <laughs> it's crude. Uh, then he reads another poem, the same thing happens. And you applaud. It's amazing. And he's so boring. <laughs> he's no more boring than his poems. I mean, I, I didn't mean to suggest. Actually, his poems are more interesting than he is. Our poems are always more interesting than we are, except for, except for Larry. <laughs> Larry is exactly as interesting as his poems, but you see what's going on there. My God. <laughs> I'm, he read all these fantastic poems about the valley here. I have, you know, half this book is fantastic valley poems, but I'm not going to read them. I don't want to make them look bad. And, uh, <laughs> Actually, his valley, he's got the landscape down better than I do. I mean, he knows what the name of the tractor is, see. I have to call up the agency. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I get the guy, is the seat uh, padded? <laughs> uh, how would my father break somebody's hand on that? <laughs> yeah. I tried writing that poem. He told me about it, and I said, I said, never write that poem. Uh, it'll hurt. Your father will be so hurt. And then I tried to write it. <laughs> See, I'm going to read a lot of city poems, because Larry, Larry, actually, Larry writes city poems. But I've advised him against it. <laughs> Larry does not listen to me, and he becomes steadily a better poet. <laughs> This is a kind, this poem has a little humor in it, unlike the last one. It's called The Suit, and it's uh, uh, about the first suit that I really picked out for myself and loved. You know, I had been, suits had been imposed upon me. The first ones had, I uh, had shorts. You know, little, I mean, I was a little kid, you know, uh, during Hoover's uh, reign, is, uh, you know. He didn't have a coronation like Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> and then FDR was elected and served, you know, until I was uh, almost out of high school. Served, was that the word? He, he never served, he ruled. Oh, he was such a, such a, I mean, he was so royal, regal. He was a Democrat, it was unbelievable. My friend. All those years, I didn't even know he couldn't stand up. It's incredible. <laughs> anyway, forget it. Anyway, uh, those early suits they had, then they had knickers. And you, know, we, uh, you didn't have to be a golfer to wear knickers back in the 30s. You, you, you just had to have a mother with no taste. <laughs> yeah. well, my parents were both immigrants. They had no idea how important it seemed for me to appear to be an American, you know? 
I mean, I wanted to be an American. Yeah. Wait, I have a poem here. It's kind of about that. God, I invent this other guy, but this, the horrible thing that's in this poem happened to me. I wouldn't admit it in this poem. It's called On the Birth of Good and Evil During the Long Winter of 28. 1928, the year I was born, it takes place in Detroit. When the streetcar stalled on Joy Road, see, that's supposed to be ironical, a, city, a street in Detroit called Joy Road, you know. <laughs> when the streetcar, there is one, too. When the streetcar stalled on Joy Road, the conductor finished his coffee, puffed into his overcoat, and went to phone in. The Hungarian punch press operator wakened alone, 7,000 miles from home, pulled on his orange cap and set out. If he saw the winter birds scuffling in the cinders, if he felt this was the dawn of a new day, he didn't let on. Where the sidewalks were unshoveled, he stamped on, raising his galoshes a little higher with each step. I came as close as I dared and could hear only the little gasps as the cold entered the stained refectory of the breath. I could see by the way the blue tears squeezed from the dark of the eyes, by the way his mustache first dampened and then froze, that as he turned down Dexter Boulevard, he considered the hosts of the dead, and nearest among them his mother-in-law, who darkened his table for 27 years and bruised his wakings. He considered how, before she went off in the winter of 27, she had knitted this cap, knitted so slowly that Christmas came and went. And now he could forgive her at last for the twin wool lappets that closed perfectly on a tiny metal snap beneath the chin, and for making all of it orange. <laughs> I got a hat like that. Yeah. My mother married a man from Chicago. I thought it was a stroke of wisdom. Moved to a bigger city with its own lake <laughs> and its own river. Of course, Detroit had the Detroit River, Chicago had the Chicago. But before anything really serious happened, she came back from Chicago with a gift from my new daddy's mother, and it was that hat. Oh, God, I prayed for divorce. <laughs> I didn't need to pray. <laughs> the man wasn't an idiot. <laughs> Before you know it, mother was hunting again. <laughs> I understand he's very happy <laughs> that he too has forgiven his mother. All right, this is called the suit. This is about buying, you know, you, the first suit you really love. And it dates back to the 40s. So the suit is sort of outrageous. No more outrageous than the crap you people wear, but... <laughs> Tasty like that, the suit. Dark brown pinstripe, the trousers rising almost to my armpits and descending pleated to great bellows at the knees, only to close down just above my shoes. This was my fine suit, made of God knows what hard fiber that would not give or crease. And such shoulders as no one my height and under 150 pounds has ever had and the great wide swooning lapel of the double-breasted job buttoning just below the crotch. So robed, I was officially dubbed a punk or wild motherfucker depending on the streets I glided down. Three times I wore it formally. First with red suspenders to a high school dance where no one danced except the chaperones, in a style that minimized the fear of gonorrhea. <laughs> I'm not 
wasn't supposed to laugh. <laughs> it was so dark, no one recognized me, and I went home, head down. Then to a party, to which almost no one came, and those who did counted the minutes until the birthday cake with its armored frosting was cut and we could flee. <laughs> and finally to the draft board, where I stuffed it in a basket with my shoes, shirt, socks, and underclothes, and was herded naked with the others past doctors half asleep and determined to find nothing. That long day it cracked from indifference or abuse. And so I wore it on the night shift at Detroit Transmission where day after day it grew darker and more unrecognizably tattered, like all my other hopes for a singular life in a rich world that would be of certain design, just, proportioned, equal, and different for each of us, and satisfying, like that flush of warmth that came with knowing no one could be more ridiculous than I. That's a great feeling, isn't it? To be totally. I'm reading mainly from my most recent book, which I like a lot. One for the Rose. It was sort of ignored. Even the Bee didn't review it. You know, and what happens to a book in America? You know, when the Bee doesn't review a book. It just nosedives. <laughs> Some years ago, I went to Birmingham, Alabama to give a poetry reading. I had a wonderful time, actually. I like Birmingham. It was a lot like Fresno, but it was damper. Yes, that was the main difference. <laughs> it was near the East Coast, too, but no one ever went there. It was kind of like our relationship to the West Coast. You know, you move here and say, oh, you're so near the ocean. You know, 14, 15 years later, you finally recover from heat stroke. <laughs> get in the car and get a blowout. <laughs> Go back and watch the Olympics again on a rerun. Anyway, before I went, I got a letter from a student. I was going to visit a class. It was a wonderful letter. It was na wonderfully naive. The students there are much like the students here and the students I went to school with them. Wayne University in Detroit, they still believed that somebody like a poet would know something, <laughs> and that their teachers would know something, that, that a college education is worth having. <laughs> they may be right. I mean, don't ask me, ask them. At any rate, I got a letter from this one student, and it just had one serious question. What is a man? <clears throat> well. I wrote this poem. I started thinking about it, and so I wrote the poem. And the poem is an attempt to answer the question. It's called, Having Been Asked What Is a Man, I Answer. And it says, the little epigraph says, after Keats. I don't mean that I wrote it you know, after Keats died or after Keats wrote it. I mean that I steal some things from Keats. I don't steal them. I take them. And it's obvious, because I mention them. Uh, I take uh, some, some of his ideas and some of his lines. Those of you who know his letters would, would know them right away. Actually, they're there. They're there. This is. It says, I will read Keats again, which I will. I'm in a hospital in my old... If I were sick, I would go to a hospital. I, none of these poems are autobiographical. I have no brothers. I have no mother. I never got the little hat. Uh, I've never written about myself. I mainly write about Larry Levis. <laughs> Is, uh, and I hope to get to his, his love life, but he won't tell me anything. <laughs> but I'll get it out of him. I have a whole epic about that hand being broken. Uh, having been asked, what is a man, I answer. So I'm, uh, this guy in the poem is in the hospital. I use the first person because we all know it's more intimate. I mean, the phone, you know, you don't say, he would like to make love to you. That's not very intimate. You say, I would like to make love to you. And she says, I'd rather have him. <laughs> Because she thinks that the third person is more intimate. Well, it's not. <laughs> the first person is more intimate. That's why I use it. It's more convincing. You get into things, hey, this is right out of his life. But it's not. I've never been sick. I've never been in a hospital. I was born on a bus. 
actually a streetcar next to a Hungarian punch press operator <laughs> who was wearing this crazy hat. <laughs> anyway, the phone. All right. My oldest son takes place in New York, a city I've never been. <laughs> I've never visited the place, but it's there. I, I see it in movies. Now, you can't miss it. It's got this tall, what's it called? World Trade Center. Uh, my oldest son comes to visit me in the hospital. He brings giant peonies, and the nurse puts them in a glass vase, and they sag quietly on the windowsill where they seem afraid to gaze out at the city smoking beneath. He asks, when I will be coming home. I don't know. He sees there are wires running from me to a television set on which my heartbeat is the Sunday spectacular. How do I look, I say. He studies the screen and says, I don't know. It takes a specialist to tell you how you look in this place, and none will. I must have slept. And when I wake and I am alone, and the old man next to me is gone, and the room is going dark, this is the Sunday that will fill the unspoken promise of all those vanished Sundays, when a shadow on the edge of sight grew near, enormous, hesitated, and left. And I sighed with weariness, knowing one more week was here to live. At last, a time and place to die are given me, and even a small reason. The flowers have turned now that the windows have gone dark, and I see their pale faces in the soft mirror of the glass. No, they aren't crying, for this is not the veil of tears. They are quietly laughing, as flowers always do in the company of men, because this is the place where souls are made, their laughter whispers. I will read Keats again. I will rise and go into the world unwired and free because I am no longer a movie. I have no beginning, no middle, no end, no film score underscoring each act, no costume department, no expert on color. I am merely a man dressing in the dark because that is what a man is. So many mouthfuls of laughter and so many more. All there can be behind the sad brown backs of peonies. <laughs> oh, thank you. But, um, my favorite flower, actually, the peony. But they're so expensive. You go to the florist, he says, what do you earn? I'm a teacher. Buy daisies. <laughs> that is. She isn't going to like you anyway. That's true, someone said that. The fox. If I were worried about my health, I would jog. And if I lived in New York and jogged, I would have the trouble that this man has. Indeed, I had the same trouble this man had. This poem does come out of jogging in Central Park where you are treated like a piece of shit <laughs> because you have only two legs. The fox. I think I must have lived once before, not as a man or a woman, but as a small, quick fox pursued through fields of grass and grain by ladies and gentlemen on horseback. This would explain my nose and the small, dark tufts of hair that rise from the base of my spine. It would explain why I am so seldom invited out to dinner. And when I am, I am never invited back. It would explain my loathing for those on horseback in Central Park and how I can so easily curse them and challenge the men to fight and why, no matter how big they are or how young, they refuse to dismount. For at such times, rock in hand, I must seem demented. My anger is sudden and total, for I am a man to whom anger usually comes slowly, spreading like a fever along my shoulders and back and turning my stomach to a stone. But this fox anger is lyrical and complete as I stand in the pathway shouting and refusing to budge, feeling the dignity of the small creature menaced by the many and larger. 
Yes, I must have been that unseen fox whose breath sears the thick bushes and whose eyes burn like opals in the darkness, who humps and shits gleefully in the horse path, softened by moonlight, and goes on feeling the steady measured beat of his fox heart like a wordless, delicate song and the quick forepaws choosing the way unerringly, and the thick furred body following, while the tail flows upward. Too beautiful a plume for anyone, except a creature who must proclaim not ever, ever, ever to mounted ladies and their gentlemen. My wonderful student, former student, and now terrific poet, liberated from the terrors of Fresno State and its monumental boredom, <laughs> Roberta Spear, asked me to read to Cipriano in the Wind. It's a political poem. That is to say, there is affection in it for someone which is a political act today. And this someone doesn't even have money. Shit, he doesn't even have the vote. He is a foreigner, and he is such a beaten man in one way, but unbeatable in another. He is a survivor, this man, this Cipriano of the Spanish Civil War. He is talking to a kid. It is 1941. The kid knows things about that war. The kid's brother has gone off to another war, World War II. And this guy speaks bad English, right? 